<coughs> this was the title that I submitted. <coughs> and I was kind of surprised when it came out and the website is... I can't remember what it came out as. Better change the world, better place or, or something. <laughs> Which wasn't my intention, actually. But I thought it was quite a... It's five hobby projects. <coughs> or... Oh! Why did it do that? Or, two beautiful papers, <coughs> five interesting problems, five half-baked solutions, two really difficult problems, and two fun problems. And not necessarily in that order. And, and um, I, I always thought that a lot of conferences like this, people say um, that the format of the talk is, uh, well, I did this stuff, <coughs> and here's the solution and I'll tell you all about it. And I thought that was rather a shame. I, I thought the purpose of a conference would... You know, I'd really love it if everybody said, you know, I've got ten problems I can't solve. <laughs> <laughs> so they told everybody about them. And then because you're a load of smart people in the audience, then they would say, hey, I think I might be able to help you solve that problem. So this is much more in, 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 in that vein. And um, <clears throat> there's some problems which interest me. And I've been working on for sometimes 40 years or so, and, and slowly making progress on some of them. So I'm just like hoping that somebody might provide that little extra bit of information to make me progress on. Most of the problems I try and solve are stuck, because I get stuck, and so I go on to a new problem. <coughs> so, um, <coughs> and I try to structure that in, in some way. So um, ask the question, well, 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 you know, all these computers, well, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Where are we going? What problems ought we solve? So the big problem areas are <coughs> energy. Can you, in case anybody hasn't noticed it, we have a problem with the amount of energy we consume and how we produce it. Um, storage, it's a big problem. How do we store stuff forever? Not, not just for a year. How do, we, how do we preserve history? In a thousand years' time, if we look back to today, are all, is all this information that's in the cloud lost forever? The newspapers we read today, will people in a thousand years' time be able to go back and say a thousand years ago they were reading these newspapers? We can do that today. Will we be able to do it in a thousand years' time? Well, I don't know. I ask some people at Facebook and things, you know, what, what happens to my digital images when I'm dead? Will, will, you know, if I have descendants in a few hundred years' time, will they be able to access those pictures? And they said, yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> they said... Security. There are bad people out there. <laughs> Naughty people. They want to rob you and do nasty things. They want to spy on you and listen to what you're doing. They put microphones in your room so they can hear every word you say. Yeah, not good. <laughs> <clears throat> Complexity. <coughs> yeah, we've built software that's so fucking complicated that nobody understands how it works. Mm. Privacy and music. That's what we want to do. The big areas. So, so what I was briefly going to say is tell you the hardware story as I, as I see it, <coughs> as I've lived through it. The software story. What's happened to software during the last 30 or 40? Well, no, actually 2,300 years. <coughs> um, five problems which I think are worthy of solution, and five partial solutions to those problems, including a new algorithm, which I have never, ever mentioned to anybody. So I'm going to try it out and see if, see if you like it. Okay. Uh, here are the five problems I was going <coughs> to deal with. Preserving history, authenticating history, gaining control of our data, reducing entropy, <coughs> and making music. Those are the five problems I want to address. And... Five solutions, five solution techniques for, for solving these problems. <clears throat> One is blockchain authentication. The other is immutable data. The other is a web of hashes, personal IoT, making play. I will go into this more. Um, so first of all, the hardware story <clears throat> from 1948 to 2016. I, I think hardware, I mean, computer hardware for me started in, two, in 1948. <clears throat> so started here with Tom Kilburn. Uh, in Great Britain. There's a bit of controversy. I mean, the Americans say they invented the first computer. And the 
Germans say they invented the first computer, and the Brits say we invented the first computer. And we are right. They're, they're, they're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, what the Brits invented was the first computer with a, store, a storable program in memory. The Americans invented a computer, but it wasn't storable in memory, so it was difficult to change. <coughs> um, and this is a Williams tube, which could store 1,024 bits stably for an hour. And it was the invention of this tube, a cathode ray tube, that, that made the first computer possible. And this is the first program. <coughs> there we go. And it's in Kilburn's log, and somewhere, you can see the date. Where is it? Uh, there. Handwritten the date. It's the 19th of June, 1948. This is the first ever program. I think it's kind of cool. You know, we can see the first ever program. It computed, it worked out, it figured out if, if a number was a prime number or not, or a composite number. Um, then it ran. Didn't write down what time of day it ran, so we don't know that. Probably in the morning, we think. But we don't know. And there it is. <coughs> uh, blown up. And here it is in the Manchester Museum of Science and Tech Industry. This is a replica, not the original. Very nice, lovely. And uh, there we go. <laughs> My wife wonders why we have to go to computer museums on holiday. So. <laughs> <laughs> she kind of likes it. She wants to go to other places. <laughs> so we do that as well. Um, and, and there's a number in the top. <coughs> Porn. Oh, 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 oh. This is my unit of computer power. <coughs> and it's normalized to the Cray 1. So 1 is the Cray 1, 1975. And I programmed the Cray. There was a, one in Europe, one in all of Europe at CERN. I was a f particle physicist. I was really excited. I can program the Cray 1. And it was like. God for a programmer to even go near the Cray one to, to see it. To, you know, you were blessed if, you, if you'd seen it. I was one of the few, pro I could go back to England and say, I have seen a Cray one. And they go, oh! <laughs> the, you are the man who has seen the Cray one, yes. <clears throat> well, it's brilliant. It was the world's first supercomputer, and it had an amazingly, stunningly fast clock. It was 80 megahertz. And it used incredibly little power, 115 kilowatts. And it was tiny for its power. <laughs> <laughs> Only five and a half tons. <clears throat> yeah, and it had eight megabytes of storage. Think of that, a massive amount of storage. This is 1975. Right, not a long time ago. I was a mere 25-year-old then. I mean, look. It's, Hardly out of nappies. And uh, yeah, well, well, we had to go and look at one, so. <coughs> <laughs> this, is, this is the Cray one. And uh, you're not allowed to sit on, the, sit, on, but sit on the stools, it said. No, no. If you get told, I got told off because I'd. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'd never, you know, at CERN, at CERN, the nearest I could get was from the observation gallery, so I had seen it. But I wasn't allowed to touch it. <laughs> So here I was allowed to touch it and try it, see how comfortable. And do you know why it's circular? It's a cylinder it's to reduce the <gasps> length of the wires, because it was a big problem. And then, OK, so the next computer was <coughs> the computer that, uh, um, which was um, 0 0.006 times the Cray one, the VAX 11780. Anybody? Yeah, you must remember that. Some of the and that was, that was the first kind of. There's a thing called VAX MIPS. And this is the machine that defines the VAX MIPS. It's a million instructions per second on the VAX 11780. So <clears throat> thereafter, we, we start using this unit, million instructions per second, the VAX MIPS. Came around in 1975. And, and, and this is the sort of stuff that Erlang was developed on. Um, kind of fun computer. If we go forward a bit, uh, iPhone 6 is <laughs> 256 Cray ones. <laughs> Somewhat lighter fits in your pocket. <laughs> um, I, I was in Chicago giving a talk, and somebody said, can, can, 
can you run Erlang on a really sort of under, you know, little tiny little underpowered computer like a Raspberry Pi? <laughs> I fell out. What are you talking about? You mean 15 times the Cray one? <laughs> And now things get scary, really scary. The NVIDIA Tesla P100, 66,250 times the Cray one. <laughs> Dedicated for machine learning. This is a machine that's going to cause mass unemployment, and I'm serious. It will take away all the jobs of anybody whose input are bit, if, if, if your job is, your input to your job is bits, and the output of your job is bits and a wire, then we can put a machine learning algorithm in between and do better than you. And it's going to happen within the next 15 years. It's going to make millions of people unemployed. We'll figure out what to do about that. Fortunately, there's a better computer. Because we are... 2.85 times 10 to the 8 cray ones. <laughs> and uh, we run at 38 petaflops and run 15 watts. And we've got 85 billion neurons and we're 5 million years old. So we've got this little window of opportunity to beat the machines at their own game. So we'll have to see what we do about that. The software story from BC 384 to 2017. Right. So it all begins, well, logic, logical thought begins with Aristotle. So Aristotle came up with modus ponens. If it's raining, I'll go swimming. It is raining, therefore I will go swimming. 2,300 years later, we can say, is, if F is of type T1 to T2, and the input of F is of type T1, then the output of F is of type T2. Right. From which we conclude <laughs> <laughs> that there hasn't been much progress in software development. Oh, well, glad you laughed at that one. Right. Apart from Erlang, 30 years later and the X here. <laughs> right, so there we go. Good. So, problem, here's some problems. Can we save history? It all started with um, Rebecca Burkett. Uh, my, my wife <coughs> pulled out a photo of Rebecca and said, um, this is uh, from 1892, and said, you know, in 100 years' time, will our descendants find photos of us? I don't know. I'll ask around a bit and ask people at Facebook. I'll ask the technical director of Facebook. And he said, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Good question. I think it's technical. I don't know. It's something I have done. So I have to ask, how much data are we talking about? <clears throat> how long are we going to store it for? Who's going to pay for it? Where do we store it? And how do we name all this data? There's an awful lot of data. Oh, that's, um, this is a problem. <clears throat> how can we provide a personal computational infrastructure? A, a computer for me. I own my data. Not a, not a computer for Facebook where they own my data. Not a computer for Google where they own my data. A computer for me. Where I say who is allowed to have my data. Not a computer where they say which part of my data I'm allowed to see. How do we do that? How can we make a safe system? People don't hack into it. How can we... Reduce entropy. It's too much software. A heck of a lot of software. Far too much software. How? We're, we're making more and more of the stuff all the time. Can we do the same stuff and make it smaller? Can we shrink it to an irreducible core? So I have a solution to this, which I've been thinking about for 30 years. And, and I got stuck. <clears throat> and I, so I had an idea about a year ago. I have a, a good idea. I thought, other people can say they're good, but I mean, you know, I had, I had an idea. I mean, you have the old idea, but once every ten years I have an idea. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and most of them are bad. <laughs> How can we do entropy? I'll show you. 
So to help me solve these problems, two beautiful papers, two beautiful bits of, of science. Um, <clears throat> the first one. Immutability changes everything. Not only does it have a nice title, <laughs> it, it kind of talks about this, this notion of immutability, which is central to Erlang, central to functional programming, why it changes the way we build software uh, and, and with lots of application errors. And the second paper is by Satoshi Nako, uh, Nakamoto. It's the first paper about Bitcoin. Um, both of these are beautiful papers. Um, I, I would say the Bitcoin paper is not in itself enough to implement Bitcoin from. I mean, it leaves a lot of detail out, so, so it, needs, it needs some supplementary reading. <laughs> so let's look at how we could solve some of these problems that I had solutions. So um, the, the first, how much time have I got? Does anybody know? When do I have to finish? Oh, oh dear. <laughs> I have to speed up. <clears throat> So the, the solution to the first part, I want to save everything forever. How do we do that? Well, the, the first step is to name everything. If we, can't, if we don't know what it's called, we're going to have trouble naming everything. So, so the first thing is to name everything. So how can we name everything? If, you know, if things don't have names, we can't talk, talk about them. Um, so choosing names is difficult. No, it's not. It's re rather easy. We can, we can take the SHA-1 checksum, or the SHA-256 checksum, the cryptographic checksum of the data, and that names it. And so we've reduced a very large amount of data to a very small amount of data. So we could name every paragraph on the internet by computing its SHA-1 checksum. Very simple to do. Um, when you store files and things like that, you have to solve several <coughs> difficult decision problems. What's the name of the file? What's the name of the directory we put it in? What's the name of the machine we put it on? We can eliminate all these problems by saying, well, the file has no name, it, it's not stored in any directory, and it's globally available, planetary available. So we store everything in a content addressable store, and we can layer this on top of HTTP. So imagine a URL. This, present, this presents us with five difficult problems. We have to choose a site name. We have to choose a path name to the directory. We have to choose a file name. We have to make it highly available. Then we have to make it secure. All of these are difficult problems. So let's make it easier, which we could do today if we got our act together. We, we could easily do this together. We could say, HTTP, any old site in the planet, so that solves the first problem. You know, we don't have to choose a site. Um, get. Well, what am I going to get? I want to get something, and I need to name it. How do I name it? I've named it with the SHA1 checksum. So let's say get SHA1. I could put SHA160 or MD5, and then the name of the resource. That has solved all the problems, all those five problems, in one fell swoop, because we don't have to choose a name. The name is that. We don't have to choose a site, because we could choose any site on the planet. We don't need cryptography to secure it, because having asked for that resource, a, ma uh, sorry, a person in the middle could not corrupt that file, because we would detect it. So we don't need any cryptography and any security. So we've solved all those difficult problems. We've made it highly available because we can go to any site on the planet to get it. And we can layer it on top of HTTP today if we want to. And we can write the servers to do that in any programming language. So that would be nice. I would like to see that happen. Browser. Sorry? Browser. Has somebody already done it? Oh, I didn't know. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or good, goody, you know. But <laughs> right, okay, yeah. Well, so how many documents have we got to store? Well, number of people on the planet, six times 10 to the nine. <clears throat> Earth becomes a red giant in five times 10 to the nine years. 
we store a thousand documents a day per year. So that's only 10, 10 to 25 documents to be stored uh, before the Earth becomes a red giant. And that's about 10 to the 50, 20, 10 to the 25 documents. The number of atoms on the Earth is 10 to the 50, so there's lots of space. Uh, DNA storage can store. IBM said, paper I wrote last week, in experimental systems can store 10 to 21 bytes per gram. So basically, we've got to store 10 to the 25 documents. We can do it in uh, 10 kilograms of DNA. And that's until the red sun becomes a red giant. So it's cool. Isn't technology wonderful. <laughs> oh, the API for this, uh, you know. The, um, <laughs> I, I mean, somebody's already done it, so I. Uh, so if you thought key value databases were fun, you know, first of all, a relational database with lots of keys and rows and stuff. And the, yeah, we just need key value databases. These are value only data, there's no keys. They're even more fun. We, we can embed this onto HTTP post. So, so actually, then, then, then you need a distributed hash table under the, under the covers because um, I, I'm going to, you know, if you do get, you know, this hash to any website, it's going to reply, I, OK, yeah, I've got it. Or it might reply, no, I don't know where it is at all. Or it might say, no, but I, I don't know where it is, but I think these guys are nearer to it. I think they know where it might be. And then you go recursively down. And this is, you can use Cord or Cadamelia or something like that, a, a distributed hash table. Oh, dear. And I was going to explain how Cord and Cadamelia worked, but... OK, co uh, well, okay Cord works like that. Um, <laughs> well, you know, I haven't got all that much time. <clears throat> And there's some literature on that stuff. So if, if, we, if we built file stores like that, we can potentially store everything forever. And, and that would answer this question of, uh, you know, where are, the, where, where are the photos, you know, in the 100 years time, 200 years, where, where are those photos? Well, they're in this content addressable store. They're not in Dropbox, because when, 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 when I stop paying my bill for Dropbox, that stuff's going to vanish. And they're not in um, Apple's ransomware, you know, which, <laughs> again, all these digital content's going to vanish when you stop paying your bills. We shouldn't lock ourselves into this stuff. Uh, next sort of part of a <coughs> solution to a problem is protocol versioning. When systems talk to each other, we, we need to make sure we're talking to the right version. Right now, um, we, we, we're using version numbers, <coughs> but there's a much better way. I mean, look, look at this. Query, get, HTTP, and you say, well, version HTTP 1. Yeah, that's the version. This is the version number of the protocol. Get something back. I don't, I don't think it's a very good way. Um, if you do it right, you would say get, <clears throat> and you would send the SHM1 checksum of the source code of the server and the source code of the client, and you would reply with the SHA1 checksum of the client, and you would check <clears throat> that the you know this is a pair of numbers that has been tested together, uh, and you would have sort of total anal control over, over every single bloody bit and make, make sure that um, everything fits together nicely. Um, authentication. Um, I, just, I, I started, actually I didn't know anything about blockchain and Bitcoin until about a week ago, so <clears throat> I was just kind of browsing, oh, that's cool. And I thought, you can use these algorithms for far more than you think. Um, so, I was, you know, so I thought, um, I said this, well, just, just as an example. Is a, is a blockchain algorithm that carries a proof chain. And, and uh, I was kind of slightly peeved about the fact that politicians and, and decision makers can make statements and, and then years later deny making those statements. And I, I don't think that's really good. They are, what, what is the technical term for that is fibbing. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, for the first time in my life, two nights ago, I shouted at a television. <laughs> <laughs> Because I thought I'd watch Fox. With it. Um, I don't have the privilege of being able to see Fox News in, in, in Sweden. Um, and and um, Nigel Farage was commenting on a, a terrorist attack in, in Britain and saying this was a consequence of not checking um, immigrants' papers and, and things at the border. And, and the people on Fox were nodding along, yeah, you were quite right. I've, I've told them. And I thought, hang on, this is very funny, because it's only happened a few hours ago. How do they... And they hadn't actually published details of who'd done it. And I thought, this is a bit premature, saying that this is a consequence of not checking. Turned out this guy is a 54-year-old 
British citizen who was born in Britain. His parents were born in Britain. He's a big time loser who's been in jail. He's got crazy ideas. He's a crazy. Right? So I, I think it'd be kind of good if we nailed. I don't, you see, I don't care. I, I, I'm not, I don't really want to say. I don't, I don't disapprove of right wing people or left wing people or anything like that. I disapprove of people fibbing. You know, if, you wanna, if you've got crazy right-wing views, you should be able to express them, but you should not be able to deny that you have expressed them later. <laughs> so, here's a blockchain. Uh, it's got the first block. You know, this is what Joe has said, <clears throat> or what several of us have said. And the first, here's my message here. Second message, third message. Here's my public key. And here's this, the digital signature. It's, you can take those two and stick them into an algorithm and it will say, yeah, the person who did that had a private key that corresponds to that public key. You always put the public key in there. You put a backwards pointer in the next block to the previous block. So you can follow that entire chain and you cannot deny um, that you did this. So, so this is... Um, the blockchain part of Bitcoin. Bitcoin's a lot more than that. <coughs> and and this, this morning, oh, so I implemented all of that in Erlang. I thought, oh, they've chosen, in Bitcoin, they've chosen some very nice algorithms, this uh, uh, elliptic cryptography. It's beautiful stuff, beautiful stuff. Uh, I don't understand it much, but it's beautiful. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I don't understand it yet. But, uh, so I thought I'd implement that bit of it in Erlang. And there you go, that's it, and all of it in Erlang. That's the, bit, that's the blockchain authentication algorithm in Erlang. And it'd be the same in... It would be exactly the same in... Exactly the same in Alexia, with, with slight syntactic differences. And uh, this morning I, I thought, oh, it would be nice to show the Genesis block. Um, so I started Googling a little bit, could I get a picture of the Genesis block? And found this um, Ken Sheriff blog, hidden surprises in the, bit block, the Bitcoin blockchain. And you see, if you go back to this, you, you, whoops, there. you can put any data you like here. It doesn't have to be, okay, in Bitcoin it's a, um, Joe transfers one Bitcoin to Fred. That's what, that's what those messages are. But it turns out you can put any message you like in there. So in the bit chain, ah, there's um, Nelson Mandela's picture, there's WikiLeaks information, there's software, there's crypto keys, there's all sorts of wonderful stuff. There are also mysteries within mysteries because the genesis block for Bitcoin, the SHA-1 checksum of that, starts with, I think it's 13 zero bits in a row. Ooh, how did that happen? Did that happen by accident? Probably not. What does it mean? So there's all sorts of, I love conspiracy theories and, 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 and uh, are there secret messages in the bit chain? Now, and who the hell was this guy who invented it? And, and of particular interest is the early Bitcoin, you say, first of all, Sat what's his name? I've forgotten his name, Sata, Sata, whatever he's called. The number one guy. Um, yeah. And you, uh, he started, people started buying Bitcoins, or he would sell things to others, early people, early transactions. So probably, they were probably him doing transactions with himself with different identities. And there's... Nobody knows how much money there is in these unspent bitcoins in the early days. But there's maybe a billion dollars there. And they're unspent. By spent, I mean they haven't been transferred out of bitcoin into cash. They're still as bitcoins. And nobody has spent them. Right. So I'm kind of speculating what would happen if you like bit one of the bitcoins that's... There's a Merkle tree so you can trace where it came from. If, if a bitcoin who's age is like three generations from the Genesis block were to be spent. All the Bitcoin mining factories would see that. And all the mafia hitmen in the world would rush to that Bitcoin machine to try and find out who'd taken the money out. <laughs> so it'd be very great fun, that would. I mean, it would. And it's not me. No, I didn't invent it. <laughs> I'm not smart. I don't know enough cryptography. I could have done the computing bit, not the... Oh, now it's written in C++. I mean, could, <laughs> couldn't possibly have written that. I don't know C++. Oh, it's horrible language. <laughs> right. 
OK, so we could extend that. How much time have I got? 15. Sorry? Oh, yeah, right. Oh, you could extend this to end all, all sorts of things. I mean, credibility. And, oh, you could do things. OK. Reducing entropy. I, I always thought, you know, um, <coughs> there are more and more functions. <coughs> and we'd like to... Dis, dis, I, what I'm thinking is, is um, could we discover that two functions compute the same thing? Approving that is very, very difficult. It's out of the state of the art. For, for small examples, you can do it. But if they were written in different programming languages, um, you wouldn't be able to do that automatically, or, and you wouldn't even be able to discover that. And in process discovery, in, in order to even countenance the idea that two functions did the same, they'd have to have some cultural similarity. I mean, you might guess by the name, but if I wrote a function and named it in Erlang and named it with an English name and somebody wrote it in Chinese that actually happened to be the same function about Chinese, how would I ever discover this fact? And I thought, if, if we could discover all functions that did the same thing, then we could choose the best one and eliminate all the others. And, I, and, I, and, and there I got stuck. <clears throat> I got stuck about four years ago, because I got to that point. And, and then I uh, thought of a way of doing that, which might work. I hadn't tried it on, at scale. And I didn't want to publish a paper about it. Well, I either thought I could publish it. I don't want anybody to patent it because I want everybody to be able to use it. I didn't want to write a paper. So I thought, actually, just displaying it in public would be adequate, you know, so that nobody could claim precedence over that. So I'm going to show it to you. And, and you know, the gentleman who said, oh, somebody else has done that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I shall now be... I have never heard of anybody who's done this. Right, so, two functions are the same if, for the same inputs, they produce the same outputs. So how can we discover that fact? Well, find all functions which, for the same inputs, produce the same outputs and remove the duplicates, and then we've reduced the entropy of the system. So, let's just do it for integers. So here's a black box, and let's suppose it was a factorial function. This is our function, and we feed it the numbers 1 to 100, and outcome, 100 answers. So two black boxes will be the same if we... Things that are of type integer to integer, they're the same if, for the same set of inputs, we get the same set of outputs. But the, the set of outputs could be pretty big, and the set of inputs could be pretty big. Ah. And then suddenly, it came to me. Factorial, we could take the SHA1 checksum of the set of inputs, and we could take the SHA1 checksum of the set of outputs. And so factorial is the function that, I mean, this is, <coughs> okay, so how do you compute that? That's Erlang's term to binary for the inputs, and Erlang term to binary for the outputs, and then SHA1 checksum. <coughs> so factorial is the function that turns that into that. And we've standardized the input to be the sequence of integers from 1 to 100. So now this thing is 160 bits. So I could put it in a database. And I could put all integer functions into a database with a key that is the SHA1 checksum of their outputs for a standardized input. And by extension, I can take any data type and turn it into an integer. The girdle mappings and things like that allow you to serialize anything into integer. I mean, basically, term to binary takes any Erlang term, turns it into a binary, but a binary it's just a base 256 integer. So any statement we make about any Erlang term is also a statement we make about integers. So we can do it this way. And these integers become very big, but that doesn't matter because we compute their SHA1 checksums. So the Haskell thing that says, uh, what's it called? You know, you can, you can search on type signatures. You could also search on value properties to see if things do what you want them to do. And I think that nobody saw it. I've, I have never, you know, now you're going to say, ah, oh, that was known years ago. But I, I have never seen it in that case. So I, I think that'd be fun. So if somebody wants to do a PhD or something, yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> P. 
please feel free. Um, how are we doing? Computational infrastructure. I built a prototype of a, a computer, a personal computer that I would like everybody in the world to have. Um, Alan Kay showed a prototype of the iPad. It was made out of cardboard. <coughs> and he took it to loads of conferences and showed people and was able to persuade people to, to, make, to make the Dyna book. I mean, the, the prototype was cardboard prototype of the Dyna book. And eventually, I, I guess he bumped into Steve Jobs or something, and, and Steve Jobs said, must have been, I mean, they were buddies, so, so made the iPad. And, Alan's furious about the iPad, he <laughs> hates it, but apart from that, it's okay. Um, so I made a prototype out of cardboard of what I want to build. I haven't brought it with me, so I've brought some photos of it, and, and I want somebody to help me build this thing. Whoops, looks like that. It's a solar panel. You see, I, I thought um, uh, process, uh, sil solar panels made out of silicon, it's just sand, we've got lots of sand. Uh, CPUs are made out of silicon. Uh, Antennas are made out of silicon. Memories made out of silicon. So I'd actually like to just blow them all onto the sub same substrate because you'd be much more reliable. It's just baked into the solar panel. I want to build this thing, and then you'd stick it on your roof at home, and you would store all your. If you want to use it, you'd get your laptop and you'd talk Wi-Fi to it because it understands Wi-Fi, and then it would say to your neighbour's one, "Hello, I'm I'm Joe's personal computer. How do you do?" Maybe we should form a grid. And they would all form a nice little grid and a little battery on it, and then uh, the sun would move, and they would say, oh, dear, my data can't be stored, because the sun's going down. So it will move the computation around the Earth following the sun. And, and then we, we make these, and we manufacture them, and we give them to everybody in Africa, everybody in China, everybody in the world. I've looked on Google. I tried to find, buy one of these things. You can't buy them. I don't know why nobody thought of building something like this. Uh, and then you put it on your roof. Uh, you know, mobile computing. <laughs> <coughs> you stick it on your car. And then when you drive to the shopping centre, and there's 500 cars parked there, they all start talking to each other and become a supercomputer. And we own our data, and we put them on there. And we don't let Facebook build data centres and use many percent, they don't want to use three or four percent of the world's power and burn coal to do that, to poison the environment. We want our own data on our own machines powered by the sun. So I'd like to make something like that. So if anybody in the audience could help me, especially people who know hardware, I, you know, come and talk to me, because I'd love to build it. I'm, I'm, uh, I'd hope that somebody would you know, start building this thing or form a company to do it. And I'll write all the software for it, I promise. Um, but I, I'm not good at hardware. Last time I did some hardware, I, I accidentally soldered a cupcake, which was... Yeah, so, so it's, it's a nice little thing. You, you can do all these things with it. Uh, other big problems... Uh, oh, dear. How long have we got? We have to answer the question, what happens when the marginal cost of production is zero? What happens to repetitive... The, the only tasks that can't be automated, intellectual tasks, are non-repetitive tasks. Tasks with a high degree of randomness that depend upon their environment. You know, nursing and doctors and things, you won't be able to automate them. They depend very, strictly, very much upon the environment. But everything else you can automate. Um, who owns my data? I think that's a very important question, who owns my data. And that, how long have I got? Oh, well, it's okay. Actually, I'm, that's my last slide. <coughs> I should have had a slide that says end, so I know. It's okay, so <laughs> that was it. <coughs> So, any, any questions, comments? It's all been done before. <laughs> well, there's a question, the paper was raised based on IPFS. Oh, it's an IPFS thing. Okay, so, right. <coughs> yeah, I keep talking to Juan Bennett. He's, yeah. He's, yeah. I'm sure your idea. Well, Juan Bennett, and, and I'm talking to um, Vint Cerf about this, and, and every, Alan Kay, and everybody wants to do this. Apart from Apple and Google, because they want to own everybody. But the people who invented the internet want to do this. Tim Berners-Lee wants to have private data pods. Vince Cerf invented the internet once, wants private data. Alan Kay wants to save it all. We all want to save all this data. But there are massive commercial interests who want to own us. And we have to resist that. Or we have to say, this is a, this is a, we, I mean, I mean it's a, in a, in a, it's a serfdom. It's a feudal economy. 
you give up some of your freedom in return for something. So, so you might say, OK, I'm happy to pay Google or Apple $10 a month forever. And you've given up a bit of your freedom there. So, so you might. I think it's a shame that, that for ordinary citizens, there isn't the alternative for something that's as well packaged as an iPhone, but which is completely open source and, and completely secure. Yes. I use adoption as a model. Sorry? <laughs> I use adoption as a model. No, I said I wasn't, because, you know, I mean, no, I would love to be, because I'd have this billion dollars worth of unspent bitcoins. <laughs> ah, but, but the problem was, how the hell do I spend them? Because the mafia would immediately <laughs> kill Joe and torture him to tickle him <laughs> to find his key. You know, they would tie me down and tickle me and say, what's your public key? <laughs> private key, I mean. Yeah, private key, private key. No. Very clever stuff, though. Very, very clever. And well worth... I don't understand it yet, but I will. But I haven't... Impl I mean, that understanding means you implement it completely as a learning exercise, and then you throw it away. But, it, but it's, it's cool stuff. I, I don't know how I'd admit... I mean, I've read about it. I, didn't, I hadn't really figured out how it worked before. It's very clever. Very, very, very... Oh, it's good. Very, very, very clever. <coughs> yeah, so... Uh, Mm. I don't think anybody can answer that question. I mean, it, it, I, I, you know, you, you, we, me, you might be the last generation of programmers. Who knows? <clears throat> so, I love the vision of getting rid of uh, this economy of getting rid of some functions, right? But surely the functional equivalent in general is going to be undecidable. Oh, it is, yes. Yeah, I mean, this is, <clears throat> this is, this is what you might call. So, so, I mean, this is weak equivalence. It's not, I mean, strong equivalence would imply proof. This is weak equivalence. It, it, it's, it makes a set of candidates that are highly likely to compute the same thing. Whether they actually do it will be, you have to open them up and decide. You know, if you're going to say, OK, so I found 450. Well, I mean, I have this problem with my disk. If I, whenever I say I've got 43,000 airline modules on my disk, and I want something that passes a URL, so I do find that part, and I've got 15 of them, and I don't know which one is the best one. Some of them I've just got from somebody else, and most of them I've written myself, and I don't know which is the best. So, so you're still going to have that problem, having, having got the candidates for entropy reduction, you still have to make choices about which the best ones are. But if we can do away with the names and things, and the namespaces, and the, all that kind of crap, I mean, why have namespaces? You've got a namespace, it's, it's a SHA-256 namespace, that's pretty good. Thank <clears throat> you.